Hello again, everyone. My name is Elliot and welcome to Developer Growth Summit 2022. This session is using GitHub to power up your static sites. Our first few little bits and pieces though, um, we are using Zoom webinar. It is completely normal. You can't see other people, but as you have noticed from chat, there are quite a bit, few people here. So feel free to interact, network, drop your LinkedIn's, do whatever makes you absolutely happy. Uh, there is a Q&A feature on the bottom of your taskbar. If you have questions for any that we'll get to at the end of the presentation, um, please put them there. If you put them in chat, I may miss it. And the only other thing is we do have a code of conduct for today's session. So please keep it light, keep it bright, keep it happy, keep it informed and lovely and inclusive. Now, want to introduce Annie Lou, who is our speaker for the event, originally from sunny Australia, much like myself. Uh, but currently based in wintery Canada, and he graduated from boot camp summer of 2019. She worked at an agency in her first developer role before moving into the startup world. Within 10 months at Pastel, she was promoted to front end engineering lead, and he is active in both design and developer communities. And in her free time, she loves to read, travel, and go camping. She also loves to experiment with CSS art and SVGs, which I totally get because I started in design as well. So without anything more, um, Annie, please take it away. Hi, everyone. All right, I hope you can all see me. I'm gonna just share my screen as well. All right, so hopefully that's getting shared. Let me just move this away. Well, good? Looks okay. good. Cool. So thank you, Elia, for the introduction. Um, as you know, today we're going to be talking about using GitHub to power up your static sites. And I'm just going to quickly run into my own intro as well, just and what I do in my day job. So as Elliot said, my name is Annie. I'm more commonly known as Annie Bombeni online. And I have a degree in multimedia design um, from Australia, but I graduated from a web development bootcamp um, in summer of 2019 in Canada. And I'm currently the front end engineering lead at a teeny tiny but super fun startup called Pastel. So, you know, like getting feedback and approvals on your websites and creative work from clients and stakeholders can be a real pain in the butt, right? So what we do is we help devs and marketing teams and designers help to do this in a much faster way with less pain. So if you're making websites, sending emails and marketing assets, uh, and that's something that you do, yeah, please feel free to check us out. Anyway, I'll dive in and talk about what we're going to be covering today. So we're going to be doing a dive into static sites versus dynamic and how they're different. And in doing so, we'll also touch upon server-side rendering and client-side rendering. I'm not going to go in too heavily into this because it's not the main focus of the presentation, but hopefully it'll be enough to give you a foundation that maybe you know, opens that curiosity door for you. Then we're going to look into how static site generators fit into all this. And we'll cover two GitHub technologies, pages and actions. And finally, we're going to pull it all together with a walkthrough on how to automate a static site generator, which is Next.js, to demonstrate how we can deploy a static site to GitHub pages using GitHub Actions. And I'm also going to throw in a small live coding demo. It's going to be my first time, never done this before. So if anything goes wrong, you know, it just happens, but yeah. And then finally, we're gonna do a recap and leave a bit of time um, for Q and A. So my ultimate goal for you today is just to learn something really useful for your career. Hopefully you'll be inspired. And most of all, let's just make like the most of our time together and have a bit of fun. So let's get started. All right, so on the internet, there are two types of websites, static and dynamic. We're gonna talk and start with static websites. Static websites are really good for content that don't change very often. So a portfolio or a personal website is a really good example of this. This is mine and the information doesn't change very much. I update my bio once in a while, but my projects, my skills, my testimonials, usually remains the same. I probably should update them, but yeah, they basically remain the same. And next we have a restaurant website. So again, information like menus, hours, locations, are not gonna change too often. And finally, 
Landing pages for product launches are another great example. So here's one for Apple Watch. When I used to work in the marketing and design department of the grocery store Tesco.com in, in the UK, I would actually design a lot of these pages where we did collaborations with companies such as Disney or O2. And these pages were always developed statically. I didn't code them back then, but I did design them. And static websites were how websites in the early years of the World Wide Web were built. So each page is a separate HTML file and assets are pre-rendered, cached, and then delivered to you via the browser when you type in the URL. If there are two pages that contain the same chunk of identical content, so for example, a footer or a newsletter sign-up block, then each page will contain the same HTML page. So basically it's replicated twice or more depending on the number of pages. So let's compare static sites to dynamic. As you might be able to conclude from the word dynamic, these sites have a lot more going than your average static site. When I look at a dynamic site, the content I see might be different from what you or someone else sees, or it may have changed again when I look at it in a few hours. In a few hours. So the first example of a dynamic site I have for you is this new site um, from Australia. So news is coming in all hours of the day. It might be a little bit hard to see, but on the right-hand sidebar in the just in column, you can see that there are news headings and underneath it says posted 12, 18, 33, 40, 50 minutes ago. And this piece of um, content here is updated very, very frequently with um, information and data that the server is providing. And the server is just a, you know, it's a computer um, or hardware that's located somewhere else that information is stored in. And then the next example, we have everyone's favorite binge worthy, worthy movie streaming platform, Netflix. So dynamic sites use server technology such as PHP um, to dynamically build a website when you visit the page. When you type in an address, your browser sends a request to the server, which then goes and finds a bunch of different information and then it returns a response. The browser then takes the information and serves it up in a fully cohesive, fully rendered page. So for example, on Netflix, the recommendations that you see are based on what you've watched before and the page builds on the fly in real time at your request. If someone else was logged into Netflix, you know, the URL is the same, but they'll see a very different set of recommendations. This process of recovering data and processing it before responding to our browsers as fully rendered web pages is called server-side rendering. And each time you make a request, this same process has to occur. So every page is independent and rendered um, separately. Traditionally, server-side rendering is the only page, is the only approach to load a HTML page. Now, when JavaScript frameworks such as React, Vue, and Angular came into the picture, it brought about new advanced rendering technologies, which included server-side rendering. Server-side rendering is a bit strange. It doesn't quite fit into the static versus dynamic umbrellas because while CSR sites can be dynamic, the server actually sends back one blank HTML page with links to a JavaScript bundle, which is like React or the framework that you're using. And it's this H um, JavaScript file that handles the dynamic rendering of the website. So when you interact with this page, your browser isn't requesting more information from the server to send back, like in SSR it's already, the information's already there. So typically in client-side rendered websites, such as SPARs, which are single page applications, they tend to feel a lot smoother and faster once the initial data has been loaded because the information is all there in the browser. Um, for the purpose of this presentation, I'm talking about client-side rendering to introduce you to it, but understand that it's on a little bit of a different axis from the dynamic versus static boxes. All right, and then moving to my final example of a dynamic website, everyone's favorite social media site, Twitter. 
So every time I refresh this page, it dynamically updates with new content that's pulled from the server. And, you know, they try to entice you to endlessly scroll. Anyway, based on all this information, you might think, hey, it's way better to build dynamic sites. You know, there's, um, you can like interact with it. It looks, looks a bit more cooler, but let's hold your horses. Like most things in life, each option comes with their own pros and cons. So let's start with the pros of static websites. Static websites are less work and easier to build. You know, they're HTML files. Um, they're easy to get started with. It's just easier. You don't have to learn anything too complicated. They also have improved security. Because there's less JavaScript, there are fewer vulnerabilities for hackers to exploit and hijack. Static sites also have improved SEO because the pages are pre-built. So search engines can quickly crawl through and index all the site and information. Static sites are also fast. They have a um, they have an improved performance over dynamic sites because the information is already there. And they have low cost. Um, you can host static sites for cheap, um, for cheap or for free even. On the other hand, they are a lot more difficult to scale and update. Because each page is a complete HTML file, if you wanted to actually um, have the same piece of information, like a call to action, you have to copy and then paste that code somewhere else, which means that it's a lot more prone to human errors. You have to update it manually because there's no content management system. There's also limited personalization. The information is the same for everyone who visits the site, regardless of whether it's you know Tom Hanks or the president of the United States or your mother. So there you go. But for dynamic sites, um, they're highly customizable because it's based on the information that websites and companies have collected on you, what you like to watch, what you like to do, and all these other things based on user data. Dynamic sites are also often used with content management systems, which means you're separating the content from the layout, which makes it a lot more easier to update as well, especially for non-technical people and teams. So they take um, advantage of template systems. So, you know, whereas for a static site, you have to copy the footer for every single page. In a dynamic site, you just make it once and then import it as a component into a larger parent page. This is really useful. You're a lot less prone to making errors if you update one thing instead of multiple instances of that thing. And yeah, dynamic sites often have tools and add-ons that other developers have created to extend functionality as well. On the other hand, they do take longer to code and to develop, which translates to greater costs as well and time. And their slower speed, um, they are a bit slower and less secure because with the JavaScript and the um, going back and forth between the server and the browser. So which one would you choose? What if there was something in the middle, say a hybrid response approach where you can take advantage of developing dynamically using templates while still publishing statically for improved security, performance, and speed. Enter the world of static site generators. So a static site generator is a tool that generates a full static HTML website based on raw data and a set of templates. It then compiles and updates all of this into a folder with the appropriate HTML styles and assets. And you can deploy these sites, um, these files for static hosting. We're basically pre-rendering data to serve to the browser. And you can think of SSGs as a compromise between a hard-coded static website and a fully fledged content management system. Less pain, more gain. Let's look at a couple of pros and cons. So you're able to code faster with templates. And we've talked about, you know, being able to just, um, it's a lot less repetitive, you're more efficient, you can change one thing and it and it you know updates across like all the instances that it's used. It's definitely a lot more maintainable. 
Uh, you also save on web hosting. At the end of the day, it's a static site and you can host static sites for free. You decrease the page loading time as well, which makes your site a lot faster and it improves SEO. And you have increased security and scalability with the gener with the generator itself. Security because it's not as there's like we don't really have the JavaScript over there. However, there is an initial setup time and learning, and it's pretty challenging still if you need dynamic interactions. And when we talk about dynamic interactions, it's things like user um, user forms, login credentials, search functionality, discussion forums and basically other server and database interactivity. But let's have a look at some of the really popular static site generators. Now, according to a source online, I found that there were more than 460 static site generators available. And, you know, everyone thinks like the whole world codes with JavaScript, but that's not true. Static site generators are not language specific. You can find them in Ruby, Python, Go, you know, JS and other things. So the first four here, Next, Eleventy, Gatsby, and Nux are all JavaScript. Hugo is Go, and Jackal is Ruby. Next has gained a lot of popularity recently. Remember we talked about the downsides of static pages, especially in regards to user-specific dynamic interactions like login and search functionality? Well, Next provides the best of both worlds. It can pre-render both static pages as well as pages that are a mix of static of SSR and CSR, server-side and client-side rendering. Later in this presentation, we'll look and we'll see Next again as we're going to use it in our demo um, on how to utilize static pages with GitHub. And speaking of GitHub, let's talk about a couple of services GitHub has that makes your life as a developer easier, which are GitHub Pages and GitHub Actions. So when you have a website that you want people on the internet to visit, you have to host it somewhere. And in the olden days, you pay for a service provider like GoDaddy or Bluehost, and then you get your site hosted on their servers. Now these days, and if you know what you're doing, there are services that will host your site for free, like Netlify and GitHub. And if you're already using GitHub um, to, if you're already using GitHub for version control and you have a static site, it's very, very easy to host on GitHub pages. At its most simple, you can push your changes to a branch and GitHub will deploy that site for you for the world to see. So, this could be your main branch, but it's really good practice to have a separate branch called GitHub Pages or something for this. Um, and that's just common practice. And let's talk about the next thing, actions. Pretty excited about actions because they're super powerful and can save you so much time. GitHub Actions are a way for you to automate some of the tedious, manual, repetitive tasks that you have to do as a developer. Now imagine that you had to deploy like, or if you wanted to deploy a static site to push to your main branch, you just type in git push origin main and then boom, a few minutes later, you see it on GitHub pages. You didn't have to switch branches, install dependencies, build a static site and then commit and then push and then blah, blah, blah. So literally by typing these four words, um, here's a list of all the things that I didn't have to do. So it's really cool, like save a lot of time doing that. And let me give you a high level understanding of how GitHub Actions work. Important concepts to understand are events, workflows, jobs, and steps. Now, an event is when you do something. For example, if you're pushing to a repo, if you're making a PR, if you're merging, or if your repo is forked, that is an event. You can think of it very similar to JavaScript on click, on mouse, and on load handlers, that kind of stuff. The event triggers a workflow. A workflow is an automated procedure that is made out of one or more jobs. And a job contains a series of steps in order to run. 
Now, these steps can either be an action, and I'll show you how to use this later, or shell commands. And shell commands are stuff that you type into your um, terminal, like npm or run or something. So it can be a mix of those. You can create your own actions, but you can also use actions created by the GitHub community. Now, a couple of benefits of actions is that it's fully integrated with GitHub. So everything's kept into the same place. There is no need for an external site or service. And also it's completely free um, for public repos and you have 2000 build minutes for private ones. There's other more advanced benefits, but for the purpose of this presentation, we won't be going into them. So now we have all the pieces. We understand what static sites are and the benefits they have. And we also know why static site generators are helpful. Let's put them together and have a look at how to deploy a, an automate, an automate deploying a Next.js static site on GitHub pages using actions. That was a mouthful. All right. So how to, these are the steps we're going to take. We're first going to create a Next.js site, and then we're going to store the code on GitHub. Then we're going to configure the repo settings. We're going to get GitHub pages to build from a GitHub dash pages branch. And then we're also going to create a workflow file in the repo. And then we're finally going to configure that workflow so that it we're exporting static files on push to main and committing them to GitHub pages branch and committing them to the GitHub pages branch automatically. So I'm also going to cover some important tips and struggles I ran to when I was working with this so that hopefully you don't make the same mistakes that I did. So this is a website I created. It's based on the Next.js boilerplate and it's a blog for my adorable cat called Rufus. It's publicly hosted under GitHub under the project name Next Rufus. So feel free to have a look if you like, we will be looking at this um, later. So yeah, I'm not gonna go into like how to, you know, like make a next JS website. So I'm sure like you can go through the documentation, but I just used the boilerplate to make this. The next step is to actually configure the repo settings to deploy from GitHub, from the GitHub pages branch. So you would basically create a branch called GitHub Pages. You can see over here in the first one, I have my main branch and I have a branch called GitHub Pages. Honestly, it could be called anything. You don't have to be, you don't have to call it, you know, GitHub Pages. You could call it like, like my cat or whatever, but this is pretty standard. And then to connect this branch to GitHub Pages in your repo, you click on the settings button and then go down to pages. When you click on pages, you see that you have a um, you have like a source option, and you want to go and select GitHub Pages. And yeah, so that's basically setting up the branch with GitHub Pages. And then next, um, we're going to actually create the workflow file. Now there are two options to do this, and the first one is in GitHub itself. So on the um, on GitHub, you will basically click actions and on the navigation bar, and it's going to open up a templated YAML file where you can change the name. So you change the name over there, but you go to actions, you click on set up this workflow, and then you can um, then you have like a templated YAML file which you can change. So this is one way that you can use to define the workflow. And I'm going to show you another way to create it, which is um, the way that I did it. And that is in the repo itself. Um, this is my next JS Rufus project directory. I created a folder called .github forward slash workflow. So it's a folder within a folder. And inside, I created github actions.yaml. Now, you might actually be wondering, what is a YAML file? Well, it used to stand for yet another markup language in 2001, but then later they actually updated it and they changed it to YAML ain't markup language. 
And the reason they did that is because it actually isn't a markup language. It's actually to emphasize that the language used here is intended for data and storing um, doc, like it's in intended for storing data information and not documents like HTML is. So it's not a programming language in the true sense of the word. And it's most often used for configuration files to store information. GitHub Action uses YAML files or YAML syntax to define the events, jobs, and steps. So let's take a look at what a YAML file actually looks like. So this is the YAML file that I use to configure my workflow. It's a template that I got online and I customized it to make it work for me. I'm going to talk about the four important concepts from earlier, which is event, workflow, job, and steps. So remember the event is what triggers a workflow, right? It's like the JavaScript handlers. So in this situation, the event is on push. My workflow, just got one, is called build and deploy. And the job, surprise, surprise, is to build and deploy my website. And the steps to do this, there are quite a number of steps in this job. First, we check out, and then we cache, cache the site, and then we install and build, which are some actions that other um, people from the GitHub community have created. And then we run a series of shell commands, which you can see, you know, npm install, npm run build, npm run export. And we also do a touch as well to create a no jackal file. I'll explain this a bit later. And finally, the last step is to deploy the website. And when we pop over into GitHub, after we press the deploy, you can see the actions in action. So again, you click on actions in the navigation bar. And once you, there's a, you can see over here that the actual um, deployment is happening. You can click on that. And if it's all working and everything is successful, it will be green like that. It says build and deploy there. Everything, there's a check, it looks good. But if it fails, then everything is red and um, yeah, it doesn't work. So that's basically how um, the GitHub Actions work. It's once you get used to it, it is, you know, you just like have, need some experience to like go into it and do it and you get a lot more comfortable with it. But if it's all successful, then you will have a lovely Rufus the Bold blog, which is what I have over here. So Rufus um, has like the main page and then there's two blog posts about Rufus. And if you wanted to change anything, you can update it in your project, push it and it will be live. And just to show you that it actually is live, this is the page over here. You can see that this is um, on live right there. If I go back to home, this is the page here and we have two blog posts about Rufus. So yeah, so that's the blog post here. And now we're actually gonna go and do a little bit of a live coding and we're going to add a third blog post um, for Rufus. If any of you saw my tweet a couple of days ago announcing this talk, um, you notice that there's a picture of Rufus. And I'm like, you know, what does Rufus have to do with this? So we're actually going to use that same picture, which is over here if my mouse goes here. Yep. And we're actually going to make a new blog post with this information. So let's give it, give it a go. Okay. So I have my project directory here, all loaded up in VS Code. This is what it looks like. And I have this public folder here with images. I'm going to, first of all, drag this image into here. And there we go. That is the beautiful picture of Rufus um, snarling at the camera with his bear. All right, and the next thing we're gonna do, we're adding a new blog post and there is a directory here called posts about and skills and hobbies. We're going to add a new one. I'm going to right click and actually duplicate this file. And we're going to call it on a Rufus Bear. So Rufus Bear and mark, MD Markdown. Uh, just so you know, um, when I, if you just like right click and try to duplicate things right now, this option might not be available. It was actually a 
um, an extension that I added. So what you call it, I don't remember what you call it, but yeah, something, yeah, is an extension. It's an extension that I added to make my life a bit easier. So I highly recommend that one. All right, so now I'm gonna just delete some of this information over here. I'm gonna call this um, Rufus and his beer. Rufus and his beer, his beer. Okay, and let's make it today's date. So 2022, 20, I don't remember if this is the month of the day or, but okay, let's go, let's leave it at April and then we're gonna go 21. Now this might crash, but let's try it. I'm gonna put a picture of that picture of Rufus. So to do this, I would go um, do that. The percentage sign, and this is the out tag. So out tag would be Rufus and his bear. Now Rufus in a basket, in a basket with his bear. So this is to add the picture and I can't remember what, I think the syntax is, I think I do curly brackets, yeah. And then I put the image, the image file. So it's in images over here and we go Rufus forward slash bear dot JPEG, JPEG. All right. And now you can do an optothorpe for hash for the um, uh, H1 heading. I was just gonna call it Rufus and his bear and his bear. And then for the rest of the information, I'm going to use something that I have written earlier so that we don't have to be here all day. So let's give that a go. Oh, I forgot to actually, you know what? I actually forgot to npm run this to make sure that this is all working. So I'm just gonna do that right now in the terminal. npm run dev, and this is all live. So we're gonna have a look here. This is localhost 300. Okay, so we see that there's the two blogs and I haven't updated it yet, right? I haven't saved it yet. So now we have this, a new one called about Rufus. So let's have a look, I'm gonna save this now. And to be honest, I will usually put this on a separate branch, but I forgot to do that. So I'm not gonna do that now, but FYI, I will probably make a separate branch and then merge that into, into main. Okay, so I've just saved this. And let's do a refresh. And here we go, Rufus and his bit, April 21st, 2022. Let's see if that works. There we go. The picture did not work, actually. What did I do wrong here? Um, oh, it's not a percentage, it's an exclamation mark. Okay, let's try that now. Save that. And hard refresh here. And there we go, Rufus and his bit. So that is a lovely, lovely new blog post. And we are going to merge this and push to main. So I'm pushing to main. This should basically work. And it will basically, we'll be able to see it on here, which is on the GitHub pages live, which we can't see right now. So we got this here. We know it's working. And let's go back. Okay, so we're here. Um, I'm going to go out of that. And now I'm gonna go um, npm git push. No, no, hang on, what am I doing? Git push, git push. And this will automatically push to my main branch and it will then run all the things necessary to hopefully everything is up to date. Did that work? And let's have a look here. I'm gonna go into actions and that did not work. Why did that not work? What did I do wrong? Get push, oh, get push orange and main. I actually tried this yesterday and it did work. So you can see that the last time I did this was 18 hours ago. And then before that was 10 months ago to make sure it worked and it seemed to work but I'm not sure what I did wrong right now. Mm, save and get push origin main maybe. I need to do that. Oh, you know what? I'm so silly. I forgot to commit my changes. I do that over here. Okay, add new first post. Okay, there we go. Do that. I'm gonna sync to the changes. Okay. 
that will automatically, I use the source control panel over here to automatically sync to GitHub and push it. Okay. And now I'm going to do that command again. Press it up, get push. I committed to not do that. Yeah, it should work. Okay, there we go. Yep, so here we go. We see this workflow, add new Rufus post. Now we're gonna click on add new Rufus post. And we can see that the GitHub actions.yaml file that I created is deploying this right now. So hopefully that will keep going and we will see. I don't actually know how long this will take. So let's come back to this in a couple of seconds and we'll look at it. In the meantime, um, I am going to share a bit of gotchas and we might see one of these gotchas later, but for now, let's just go through them and then we'll have a look at the, um, we'll go back here. Oh, it's finished. Okay, so build and deploy. Let's have a look at this. We're gonna go and refresh this page here. Whoops, not that one, this one here. And let's see if that new blog post has came in. And if we don't see it, then that's going to be really strange because, okay, we're going to go into the GitHub actions and we're going to go, sorry, we're going to go into the, into here and we're going to look in GitHub pages over here and we're going to view the deployment. I'll go through this in a little bit. It did not show it. <gasps> I don't know why. I'm so sorry. Oh, there it is. I just had to hard refresh. Okay. So Rufus and his bear. The picture might not work, okay, and I know exactly why that didn't work, but I will go through it in a little bit. So let's go back to some of the gotchas that I experienced while actually doing this. So first of all, first of all, we need a no jackal file in the GitHub pages branch. And the reason for that is because the underscore next directory is not served by GitHub by default because they use by default, they use jackal to build the static pages and Jackal ignores the underscore next directory. So we have to tell GitHub to ignore, um, to not use Jackal. So you can manually add this to your out folder where your static pages are compiled into, but I actually decided to add this action into my workflow so that it will be automatically created, which you can see over there. Touch to create a new file. I'm going to the out folder and add the dot no Jackal file. And the next thing that you can you have to do is to make sure that you delete out from your um, .git ignore file if you're using the next boilerplate template that they um, provide. Because I was stuck on this for a little while. I was like, why doesn't it work? And that is because your static files are compiled into your out folder. So if you ignore this folder, you will not have a site. So yeah, so make sure that you actually remove that from your git ignore. In newer versions of Next.js, there is an image component, and this image component will not work with your um, with the Next export. And you can see the Next export over here. It's one of the commands or steps that is run with um, with the workflow. But so, if you want to have a there are workarounds workarounds for this that you can look into if you want to use this component. But it's basically really important to be aware of. Now. The reason why this image didn't work over here is because of this. Images and navigation, if we find that it's not working, it's because we have to use environment variables. When your site gets pushed onto GitHub pages, Next doesn't know that it's under our repo name, which in my case is anybombenu.github.io forward slash Next Rufus. It just thinks that it's on anybombani.github.io. And because of this, we can actually use something called environment variables. So I created a configuration file where I added the base path and asset prefix to reference something called the process.environment.next underscore public base path, which basically allows us to check which environment we're on. And so we define this next public base path in our YAML file, as you can see here, 
my public base path is forward slash next Rufus. And then I created a utilities folder where I added a prefix to reference next Rufus in production and nothing if it's in development. So to do this, we import the file and then we add the image path like so. So import the prefix from our utilities and library. And then we add this prefix over here with um, template literals. So I'm gonna go back to my live coding. As you can see over here in this file over here. Now, to be fair, I never done this before. This is the first time I've added an image to this. So I don't know if the environment variable is going to work, but let's give it a go. So template literals, dollar sign, curly braces, and I think it's just called prefix. I'm hoping that I don't have to import anything here because um, my parent file will import this markdown in there and hopefully that it will just stay. All right, so made this change update over here. Um, on local, this should still work. That is not local. My local host is over here. Let me just run this npm run dev and let's see if that still works on local host. Rufus and his bear and it's broken over here. Yeah, okay. So that might not actually work and uh, I'll probably have to fix this later. But I'm curious to see if this will actually, let's have a look and see what happens, what this gets translated to. So yeah, it just kind of added that prefix there. So it probably won't work. Let's give it a go anyway. I don't think it will work. I think I'll do something else with the markdown file to actually make it work, but let's just add it, add prefix um, to markdown for image. Commit that, push that. I see there's lots of people adding chatting in the chat. I'm sorry, I'm not able to have a look at it, but um, let's have a look. I'll have a look afterwards. All right, so that's been pushed. I'm gonna get out of this and I am going to push it. That's already done then. I've pushed it there. And let's have a look at the deployment history and actions. And there is a new one there. Add prefix to markdown for image. This will probably not work to be honest, but hey, you can at least see what's going on. Okay, so if it doesn't work, that's fine. But this is good for you to know with if your images and navigation doesn't work, if you're making a static website using Next.js. And now I'm gonna to go to the final gotcha. And this honestly took like two or three hours of my life that I'll never get back. I had a working solution, but when I was refreshing my page, I couldn't see any changes. So I thought my page, my code wasn't working and your static page might not show immediately after your workflow runs. So I don't know if you noticed before when I was actually refreshing the page live, it wasn't showing the third page. And the way that I, made sure that it's my latest code has deployed is I did this. So you can go into your project repo and on the right hand column, you see something called environments and there's something called GitHub pages. You want to click on that and it will then open your deployments activity log. And then you can actually view deployment. And once you view the deployment, that will give you the latest version of your site. Probably have to do a hard refresh maybe, but that actually works. And trust me, like it, I, I literally lost a few hours of my life trying to figure this out. It was so annoying. So there you go. So that is um, that is the live coding section. And let me just switch back to that, see if that has that has deployed. So I'm gonna do this live. I'm gonna go to next Rufus, gonna go down to environments, click on GitHub pages, there is my deployment. I'm gonna view that deployment and here it is. And Rufus and his bear, it did not work. That is a-okay. At, at least the deployment worked anyway. All right, so now we're gonna go into just recap and then there's a bit of time for Q&A as well. So in to recap, 
static sites are for content that rarely or never changes. Dynamic sites have large customizable user experiences that rely on server or database interactivity. Static site generators are ways that you can, it's a really good way for you to code dynamically using template, templates and publish statically. GitHub Pages is a really easy place for you to host your static site for free. And GitHub Actions is a really great way to automate processes to cut down on the repetitive, rep repetitive manual tasks that you have to do and to speed up your development process and workflow. So remember this, if nothing else, if you're using a static site generator to create a static site, you can take advantage of the free integrated GitHub ecosystem. You can host your site on GitHub pages and automate your workflow with GitHub Actions. Thank you. And this is my uh, website and that's me on Twitter. So- Awesome. Elliot. Thank you so much, Annie. Um, I am very jealous of Rufus and I am now emotionally invested <laughs> in the outcome of that blog. So please don't uh, ever let it die off. All right. I want, <laughs> have to you, have, you have to make that a thing now. I want to see the adventures of Rufus. That's He's too funny. Very good. Uh, we now have some time for Q&A. Not a lot of time, but some time. So if you have any questions, please pop them in the Q&A box. Um, have a look here. Oh, they're coming in thick and fast now. Of course you've all waited. Uh, Dunlin says, can I add blogs to a static website? Also, is it possible to bypass Jekyll processing on GitHub pages? So, okay, adding blogs to a static website, absolutely. So the process that I actually showed and demonstrated was for a blog. And as long, most blogs are not interactive. You're not like clicking on things and like it doesn't rely on your data, your, your user data. So a blog is a fantastic, fantastic, um, like a fantastic way to, for, no, not way, sorry, a fantastic example to use for a static website. Is it possible to bypass Jackal? So I know for, if you're using Next.js, you do need the no Jackal file. So you can go back. Um, I will make my slides available so you can have a look at that information again, but you will have to bypass the no Jackal processing by using a dot no Jackal file for GitHub pages. If you're using, if you're using Next.js specifically. Hmm. Hopefully that makes Good. sense. Sylvia says, and I love this, uh, the question is legitimate. Was it easy to customize your workflow template or is there a learning curve to it? And then says, love Rufus, by the way. <laughs> yeah, Rufus is great. <laughs> Thanks, Sylvia. Yes, it's okay. Is it easy to customize your workflow template? When I first started, because I didn't quite have an understanding of um, GitHub Actions, it was actually quite difficult for me because I didn't know what like actions that all those main steps towards. So I actually went through like a process of um, researching to understand everything. And once I actually understood what all those little, um, the four sections were. So if I ever, if I go back and, you know, look into like the workflow, the steps, the, um, all those different things, once you understand what those things are, then yes, it is actually easier to, um, to customize it because as long as you understand those, the steps are show commands, um, which you can use, or if you use actions, you can, there's a lot of actions that you can search on GitHub that other people have developed and build and the build and deploy workflow is one of the most popular ones on GitHub that you can use. So if I can do it, I am hundred percent sure you can do it too. And if you have any questions, feel free to DM me or whatever. Yeah, we might just take one more question just for the sake of time, um, which they just removed. But it was a question about uh, asking uh, as a junior coming out of boot camp in the context of this conversation, what languages um, should be focusing on if they want to go down this path. Yeah, this is a great question. So it really depends. Like if you're coming out from a boot camp, it's probably likely that you're talking about a web development boot camp, right? So I'm going to make the assumption that it is a web development boot camp. And most of the technologies that is going to be taught is JavaScript. But 
it depends where you are in the world you are, right? Like right now, JavaScript is very popular, but depending on where you are, some countries might use like, it might be worth learning Python or something else. Um, it also depends if your bootcamp is front end or back end or full stack. So there are different variations. I think the best tip that I can give you is that trust what the bootcamp um, curriculum has is like is offering you and like look but take things in your own hand as well like in your country look at the jobs that are most needed right now like what will get you a job and then learn that language and for that kind of job and the kind that you actually want javascript is really useful like i said and another thing i would say is like don't jump around like don't go javascript python go ruby i would say that would be a um, mistake that a lot of like big beginners make that they try to jump around and learn everything, which means you kind of not, you don't really learn anything deeply. Awesome. So that would be my advice there. Good advice. All right. Thank you for all your questions. Um, we will wrap it up there. If we didn't get to your question, um, can reach out to Annie after this. Uh, we'll add some ways in the chat, uh, but Annie, what is your preferred way uh, if someone wanted to ask more questions to you. Yeah, favorite social my, channel? My, my DMs are open on Twitter. That's probably the fastest way to get in touch. So yeah, it's Annie Bombani with an underscore. I'm so annoyed about the underscore. There's somebody else yeah. who has Annie Bombani and they literally haven't used that account for over a decade and Twitter would not give it to me. But yeah, it's Annie Bombani underscore. Very good. Um, any final thoughts or encouragement that you'd like to give everyone before we officially end the session? Well, thanks so much for having me. I really had a lot of fun kind of like learning about GitHub pages and actions and everything and being able to share it was a really great way for me to um, relearn uh, all these things myself. Um, wishing everybody the best of luck in their career. Um, don't get too stressed over JavaScript. And if something is hard, just remember that it's just it's something new and it's okay to suck at something new and the more you you know try it and go at it it just definitely become easier over time so yeah just wishing you lots of encouragement for that very good well thank you very much annie uh, that is the official end of the session everybody so thank you so much for joining a little quick reminder um that we do have a swag giveaway going so if you do use social Hashtag DGS2022 in your post uh, to increase your chance to win. Doesn't have to be anything complicated. Go with your learnings or just show some love to the awesome speakers that we've had, um, especially if Annie's done a fantastic job and showed us her cat. Please yeah. preach. Um, uh, another reminder, also, if you'd like to be a speaker of your own event in the future and share your experience with fellow devs, um, please check out the Code Mentor events homepage all the links are in chat. We have events every week outside of conferences and summits, so they really are awesome. The next event will be how Netflix thinks about DevOps with Tejas Chopra, and that's at 1 p.m. Pacific time, which is very, very shortly. So I hope you, I see you all there. Um, I'll leave this webinar open for another five minutes in case anyone wants to network or chat, drop your LinkedIn's in or any other, anything else. Uh, until then, I'll see you in the next session. Thank you very much. Thanks, Annie. Thank you. Take care, everyone. <laughs>